Well, I hesitate to say that I'm going to compress 30 hours of uh, lecture into 10 minutes uh, after the last session, but I am, in a sense. I want you to lean back and let the ideas wash over you, and I want you to grab what's meaningful to you, and I want you to act on it. Because everybody in this room is critical to addressing sustainability, to addressing climate change. Climate change is real, and it can be disastrous, but the alternatives can be spectacular. It's important for us to know that the United States has the largest ecological footprint, I'll talk a lot more about that, uh, with the uh, highest, or one of the highest quality of life, but we actually are achieving that high quality of life at a level that is double, triple, quadruple our peer nations. We have tremendous opportunity to sustain quality of life and cut our footprint in half. The issues that we have to address uh, range from energy, to access to nature, which you've heard about today, to healthy air, to access to water, to materials and the, and the uh, depleting resources that we have there, to mobility, and to community. It's important to note that we are actually diminishing our res energy resources faster than they can be uh, reproduced naturally, and that there are many in our society who do not have adequate access to them. Uh, clearly in the third world, but also in, in this country, we've got uh, families, American families with dependent children spending often a quarter of their disposable income on energy, and it's often a trade-off between energy uh, for heating the house or food or clothing. There are lots of things we can do. Uh, the first thing we can do is stop vampire loads or parasitic loads. These are loads that are doing very little service, if any, and there are two types. They're active standby, where there's actually doing something for you, like your DVR, and there's passive standby, which is doing nothing for you, that we're just literally sapping, like a vampire, energy out of the wall. We can also maximize sleep, reduce the amount of technology that we introduce, the redundancy of technology. Most of these machines have some sort of parasitic load, even when they're not in use. We use them for less than an hour a week, and then we end up letting them sap energy uh, the rest of the time. We can support environmental coasting, which is to embrace nature region by region. This is Smith College uh, University Center. As you can see, it's a beautifully daylit space. Unfortunately, the electric lights are on, uh, something that uh, the control systems still have to learn. This is where we are in America's buildings. We're using energy to heat, cool, light, and ventilate, and it uh, caps off at about 40% of the nation's energy. This is where we need to be. Let me talk about how we get there. We have heating loads, which is still the dominant load in all buildings, commercial and residential nationwide. This is what conservation does through weatherization and, and in, uh, insulation. This is what conservation plus passive solar heating does. And this is what passive solar heating looks like. This is the cooling load in America. These are actually office building averages across the US. This is cooling loads. As you notice, we're cooling year round. It's because we build buildings that are too deep and they can't actually uh, dissipate their own heat. This is what conservation will do. This is what natural ventilation and conservation will do. This is what natural ventilation, night ventilation and con conservation. This is all about access to nature. And this is what design for conservation looks like, shading, which can displace 20 to 40 percent of today's cooling. How beautiful can we make our, our building futures? This is the ventilation loads in American buildings. We seal most of our buildings today. Children who are supposed to have access to nature uh, go to daycare centers that are behind fixed glass, much less an access to an outdoor space. Uh, so we have to run our ventilation systems 7 by 24. This is what a naturally ventilated building consumes. And this is what it feels like. Lighting in our buildings with inefficient systems. 10% uh, of all the US electricity use is for lighting buildings during the daytime. Lighting with efficient systems, better lamps, better controllers and ballast. Daylight responsive lighting, where we turn off lights in areas that where daylight is abundant, and then design for daylight. And this is what a daylight classroom looks like. This is where we are now. This is where we need to be. And we can't get there without both conservation and passive strategies. The exciting thing about designing for natural conditioning is that it actually makes architecture regional and not national. You would stay in a Holiday Inn in Phoenix, and it would feel very different than a Holiday Inn in Pittsburgh. There's also a challenge in terms of shared access to healthy outside air. Some of that is driven by our, our, our transportation planning, which I'll talk about in a minute, but a lot of it is also driven by our power plants. So every step we make to reduce our uh, electricity demands will improve the air. 
Right now, power plants are only 30% efficient. The rest of it is going up the chimney as waste. Uh, it's waste heat that can be used, and throughout most of Europe, that waste heat is being recaptured as heating for uh, houses and, and businesses. We also have serious challenges in terms of shared access to fresh water. Uh, in the United States, we consume the most water per capita without any quality of life gain for that water consumption. We use potable water for everything once, and we flood our cities and we contaminate our rivers. If we design around sharing water, which is a humanitarian and a sustainable thing to do, we actually make more beautiful and recreational. This is an example of a rain garden at Carnegie Mellon. There are a couple of rules that are pretty obvious. All water infrastructures become visual and recreational amenities. They do not become bigger pipes. We do not dig up our streets to handle our stormwater. We handle our stormwater with nature. There's Denver and uh, uh, Boston. Runoff is eliminated. All site water is captured and used on site or used for living landscapes. These are two European projects in which there is no stormwater pipe. A concrete budget is issued. Non-porous services are severely taxed. All water is used three times. First as potable water, then as gray water, then as black water. And all rain and storm water become recreational and visual um, art. Uh, this is a project in Dresden, Ger uh, Germany by Herbert Dreisaitl, uh, a, a wonderful, playful uh, a Rub Rubus uh, cube. I had to rush out in the rain to see this particular project. Incredible um, inven invention, innovation. All roofs become visual amenities, the fifth facade, and they produce water or they produce habitat. We need to consider shared access to material resources. Uh, building materials are often rare or toxic. Building consumes over 40% of all raw materials that are used every year. It's still increasing with the architecture of excess and with design for obsolescence. Uh, we have to design adaptive reuse. We have to design with less. We have to design with sustainable materials. We have to design for change. We have to design for disassembly. And when we do that, we define a new creative vision. At the same time, the electronic world needs to stop trash. We have to design for longevity, for capacity, for uh, variability, for take back, for disassembly, for re-engineering. We need to concern ourselves with shared access to transportation and mobility. Uh, right now, we still are in a single-use zoning. This is something that very few industrialized worlds do. Unfortunately, we're now exporting it to China. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure soon we will, the America will be exporting it to India. We believe that it's useful to have housing parks, school parks, office parks, shopping parks in separate places divided by highways. We have to shift away from single-use zoning and car-only access to ensure opportunities for young, for old, and poor. 20% of African-American homes have no car. 8% of all Americans of driving age have no car. 25% of Americans who are over 80 or under 16 cannot move by car. That means a third of America's population are disabled in a car-only development. We need to design for mobility. Uh, what it means is we need a transportation portfolio. We are actually in a state of transportation poverty in the United States. The rest of the world is looking at portfolios. We are still relying on cars. Alameda County is a suburb of San Francisco. Compare its transportation choices to San Francisco itself. We have to decide which future we want, and ultimately, if we are serious about sustainability, about access to water and energy and materials, and certainly access to nature, we have to go back to walkable whole life communities. One of the reasons why only one in five kids walk to school is that they can't walk to school. They cannot cross a highway. What happens when we go back to walkable communities is we actually improve the health of children. During the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, the Center for Disease Control continued to track uh, asthma rates, uh, emergency uh, uh, treatment of asthma, and they found that because of the traffic reduction for the Olympic Village, because they cordoned off whole areas of the city, they reduced PICO zone levels by about 30%, and asthma emergencies went down by 43%. Some people say it's because they couldn't get to the hospital, but actually all other emergencies, <laughs> all other emergencies were made constant. So clearly, we are looking at a direct link with our car-only uh, mo mobility and the asthma growth in our children. 
There are also other costs that we're all socializing and, and, and sharing. Uh, street and roads, just to maintain street and roads in sprawl neighborhoods is $3,000 a household. Uh, significantly higher than infill uh, uh, urban communities, uh, the utility extensions, the actual water consumption, the energy consumption, and even postal delivery is uh, 300 times higher. So we literally, we share these costs and allow for single-use sprawl to continue. Which brings me to the last point, which is shared access to a whole life community. The importance of being able to get families back together to uh, uh, create neighborhoods of communities that no longer separate social, cultural, economic, and age differences. How rich our lifestyles can be if we really design around local uh, communities uh, that are diverse in nature. And with that, we really need to show some pictures. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.